It's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be back in Bangalore. I usually come every one, one year and a half, so it's, it's a nice place to come and talk to people. Today I'm going to give the, the first lectures on the role of entropy in uh, soft matter. It's going to be very basic at the beginning. And we we'll go really through all the steps uh, that have uh, taught us about the meaning of entropy and how to exploit entropy in uh, controlling the self-assembly of uh, materials, so, as you will see later. The uh, outline of this uh, series of lectures is uh, start uh, by clarifying the concept of uh, entropy, at least in soft matter, or in reality in general, because many of us uh, grow up in high school and uh, as years of university by learning that entropy is order. And the, my message that I'm going to give you is that uh, one has to be really careful by associating entropy with order. and should really stick with the real definition of entropy, which is the log of the number of microstates. And we will, be, we will see a lot of examples where entropy drives ordering process, especially in the first part. Then I will go to the second part where I will show you that entropy is a strong attractive force very often. You can control this force to create the type of assembly that you like. And this will be the discussion of the depletion interaction, the discussion of what I call the Safram entropy, as combinatorial entropy, and then uh, I will see some application to DNA functionalized colloids. Then a little bit of this uh, self assembly process, uh, and perhaps uh, at the end, some discussion about the competition between energy and entropy, and how this competition between energy and entropy can provide interesting uh, patterns for uh, evolution of, uh, of a physical state. There's been a lot of uh, uh, nice uh, uh, review on entropy in, uh, in soft matter already, and if you are interested in this topic, you might go and look at this recent article on soft matter by Fernando Escobedo. It's a nice article to read. It's not the only one. <coughs> But he is discuss all these uh, pieces of entropy that we will also encounter in these uh, lectures today and tomorrow. Is mixing entropy, the entropy that you gain by mixing two different compounds, the center of mass entropy, the one that controls packing. We will see the case of our spheres today. Rotational entropy, again, the, the entropy that controls the orientational uh, ordering of the, pro of the system. We will discuss this pneumatic transition later on. And you should have uh, already discussed uh, with uh, Sanat Kumar the role of entropy in uh, polymeric system, in micelle formations. So I won't, will not discuss uh, entropy associated to polymer, despite the fact that it's a really, really relevant uh, uh, field in, in soft matter polymer physics. Okay, so let's, let's start from the very basic uh, canonical examples of the, fact, of the fact that entropy can be really a strong force uh, for uh, ordering. And this is uh, a case which has been debated a lot and has been solved roughly in 1957, in computer simulation first and then with the experiment that I will show later. And you might be surprised that uh, it took so long to really understand, answer the question if uh, hard spheres are supposed to crystallize or not. And it's really interesting to, this, to think that uh, the solution to this problem, in some sense, was already uh, known to the broad community of physicists because on Sager's solution for, uh, that we will discuss later on uh, orientational entropy had already been uh, published two decades before. But still, this will uh, teach you how it's difficult uh, for different, even close by fields, to discuss and interact uh, together. So people have been discussing a lot. There has been a, a nice meeting where a lot of famous people discussed this, this issue. They voted, 50 of them voted in favor, 50 against. And of course, the right one, not the good one, the smart one, were the one that really understood that hard sphere could easily crystallize. But uh, it's, not, it's not strange, right? It's, uh, there were reasons why 50% of them had voted in the opposite way, because if you look uh, uh, just two microscopic representation, or in this case of uh, nine, uh, eight, I uh, hate R-spheres in a box, and you see a disordered configuration and an ordered configuration, a crystalline configuration, and then ask you which one of these two has a higher entropy. 
then of course uh, you are driven by your intuition that entropy is proportional to disorder to say that this is going to be the configuration which has the largest uh, entropy. And if that is the case, there should be no reason why uh, such a high density a system should go from here to here and crystallize. Right? High density. A small density is clear that it's not going to happen, but high density, this is the same density. So here you have a system, constant volume, constant number of particles, why do you want to go from this very disordered state to this very ordered state, thermodynamically? So that was essentially the, the, the key reason for this uh, debate uh, in, back in the 57. And of course, the experiment shown that uh, indeed uh, our sphere crystallizes. So even if you have a, a particle which has nothing, no energy, just a hard core, a student volume interaction, and this you can do experimentally by coating a colloidal particle with polymer brushes, very tiny polymer brushes to prevent the attractive Van der Waals uh, interaction between the, the colloidal particles, so that this becomes a very nice model for uh, our spheres. Then this, this system forms a beautiful FCC crystal, the one that you see here in this microscope image. So there is no doubt that uh, our sphere do crystallize with uh, driven by entropic effect. And this was the, the first uh, key experiment that showed that in the work by Pusey and Megan in Appear in Nature a long time ago now. And they showed they prepare samples of these uh, our spheres at different concentration. They waited uh, one day and they noticed that the one in the middle for certain range of densities of packing fraction, they started to show crystallites. And you see the, the presence of the crystallite by the colors which are scattered by, this, uh, by these samples, which are Bragg refraction of the crystallite that you saw here. Different orientation, they scatter in different ways and you, you see different, uh, different colors. If you keep waiting in more time, then uh, the interface between the, the disorder phase and the, the order phase gets uh, more and more well defined. And then at the end, you can show that not, if you have a system of hard sphere with a packing fraction less than 49%, 49% this system is never going to crystallize. So it's really thermodynamically stable is the fluid. If you go from 49 to 54, you see coexistence between two different phases, the, the crystal phase and the fluid phase. You see that the uh, increasing density, the meniscus goes up and up until you reach the boundary where the crystal is the stable phase and then the entire sample crystallizes. If you go to even larger concentration, then we enter in the physics of glasses, which will be also discussed, uh, have been already a lot in this, uh, in this school. But I will not uh, touch this, this topic myself. Okay, so let's now, so we have understood that indeed the order it's maximizing the entropy in this case. And so let's try to understand why this is happening, why our intuition was, was wrong, so, so badly wrong. And uh, indeed, if you think about it, when you have a system of, of our spheres in a, <coughs> in a box, sorry, and you want to maximize the entropy, there are two contributions that you have to account for. One is the, what I'm going to call configurational entropy. This is, there are many names for this, uh, for this entropy. Probably configuration is not the best name, but uh, I like it. It's related to the number of configurations, the one that you really see with your eyes in some sense. And then there is another source of entropy that uh, we should not, not, not uh, forget, which is this what I call translational entropy, cage entropy, whatever you like. Let's go back to our picture here. This configurational entropy is the number of different ways I can arrange these eight particles in my box in a disordered way. And uh, of course, in the case of the crystal, I have just uh, one way of putting them, the one that is in the picture. So it's clear that our intuition is, is related to this configurational entropy. And this is more disordered than that, more microstate here than there. But then there is another entropy, another piece of entropy, which is the number of different microstates that you can sample at fixed topology, a fixed configuration. And you see already from this picture that uh, here the particle can rattle a lot, can explore a lot of microstates, while in, in this case here, many of the particles are essentially frozen. They cannot really rattle. And rattling is exploring phase space, so it's counting more and more microstates in your system. And so in, in this case, you have a much larger amount of this vibrational entropy here than you have there. Let's look at the mean square displacement 
in this, uh, as a proxy of this uh, translational entropy. How much space can I really sample if I am in a disordered configuration as compared to the one in an ordered one? And she yesterday showed you the behavior of the MST for, for glasses. Here yeah, I'm just showing the case of very high density, very high packing factor, 62, 63, and 64. And I compare the one in, in this uh, disordered arrangement of our spheres at this packing with the one of the crystal at the same, at the same packing. And you see very clearly that uh, the, the R spheres in a disordered configuration rattle less than in the crystal. And this becomes dramatic when you go to very high packing fraction, 64. Here, the, uh, essentially, the R spheres are frozen. They don't really. This is 10 to the minus 5 in unit of sigma square. So the particle really don't have space to move when you reach this very large packing fraction. Still, in the crystal, they have a lot of space. And indeed, uh, these conditions of freezing in the crystal will be reached at uh, 74%. So there's still a lot of space here that, for the particle in the crystal, which is missing in the R sphere, disordered R sphere. Okay, so let's put uh, all these things uh, together. We have a, a diagram that shows us how the entropy changes with the volume of the particle. So large volumes is low density, small volumes high densities. So here we are in the, in the stable fluid, and if you compare the entropy of the, the fluid, the black curve, compared to the entropy of the crystal, you see that on this side here, indeed, the fluid has larger entropy than the crystal. If you go to very high densities, the one that I was telling you before, is the opposite. The crystal, the red line, has a much larger entropy than the, the fluid. So the crystal is going to crystal, the, the system is going to crystallize for sure in this region here. In the middle between these two extremes, we have uh, the coexistence that we've seen in the experiment, because you remember that uh, in this system, entropy is the free energy. There is nothing more, there is no energy. So entropy is the negative of the free energy. And you remember that the derivative of the free energy with respect to the volume is the pressure. So points which have uh, along this uh, dotted line here, this point here and this point here, have the same pressure, because they, belong, they have the same, uh, the same slope. And so they have the same temperature, Temperature is relevant in this case, they have the same pressure. The intercept of, the li of this line will give you the chemical potential, and it is the same. So these two points have the same chemical potential, same pressure, same temperature. So means that these two points can thermodynamically coexist. So all points which are in this uh, white region over here, you gain entropy, despite the fact that on this side the entropy of the crystal is larger than the liquid and the opposite on this part here, they gain entropy by phase separating, by creating a, a, a system with a meniscus in which you have a staple phase and a, a, fluid fa a crystal phase and a fluid phase coexisting. So we have uh, the, the same trend that we saw in the pictures, crystal coexistence and then fluid again. And of course, I picked some color to remind you that uh, we are in India. Okay, so this is for, uh, for, the, for the translational contribution of the entropy. And the message is entropy is indeed always keep in mind the log of the number of states is not uh, what we feel as order. The same concept I was telling you was already, had been already discussed in the community in 1949. There was this beautiful paper by Lars von Sager. It's showing exactly the same, the same story. Here, entropy drives the, the ordering transition. Particles which are uh, non state they prefer to assume some ordered configuration to maximize the entropy. Let's see how, how it goes. I mean, this is uh, a particle, for example, like uh, this uh, cylinder, uh, this ellipsoid or cylinder or some type of long pasta that we have in Italy. Then you go from isotropic to pneumatic on increasing packing. And we, have, we are familiar with this, uh, that if you want to put a lot of matches in a box, you really need to order them. Or if you want to put pasta in a container like that, well, you really need to, to order them. You have to put all the particles in the same orientation. That's uh, what we call nematic phase. So let's see how the theory of uh, Onsaga was uh, developed. It's a very nice and, and clean theory, so it's, it's nice to go back and, and look at it. He said, OK, let's assume that the particles uh, are, uh, with different orientation can be classified as different particles. So I attach a label to each particle according to its orientation. And then uh, if those are uh, non-interacting particles, I can write the, my partition functions as the product of the partition function of the single particles. And they group together the ones that have the same orientation. Let's call it uh, Ni are the ones that are the orientation I. 
And then my partition function in the ideal gas approximation of this distinguishable particle with different orientation is just the product of all this uh, ideal gas-like partition function. And from here, again, I can take the log and I get the entropy, which can be written in this simple way. Now, of course, this is only ideal gas. You need to add at least some interaction to it. And the, the main interaction is, again, is secluded volume. So you can do it in the simplest way at the virial level, so just in counting the product of densities over here. And that's the coefficient that calculates the amount of microstate that you suppress in phase space by approaching in to the, with different orientation i and j. And this quantity here, which is the excluded volume, can be calculated analytically for, uh, for, uh, for cylinders, uh, different aspect ratio, and there are expressions to, to quantify this, uh, this free energy over there. Okay, so let me just uh, convince you that indeed there is a significant change in uh, this reduction of phase space, number of microstates, by associated to the ordering process, and think uh, the way, so you take one particle, you put it in, in the origin oriented along the zeta axis, and then you say, okay, now I, 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 I move close by another particle with this orientation, 90 degrees. When, where is the center of mass of this particle? Where, where can it go? And you see very clearly from the, from the image that the center of mass of this particle has to be outside from this dashed, uh, dashed uh, parallelepiped. So you have uh, L square, which is the surface area, times uh, 2D, which is the diameter of this uh, of the cylinder, of this volume here, 2D L square, in which this central, part, central mass of the incoming cylinder cannot enter. So those are all microstates that are killed by this relative orientation. If you instead put together two particles which are exactly aligned in the same way, you convince again immediately that the center of mass of this particle, incoming particle can, is excluded only by this volume that are dashed here, this cylinder that you see there. And this cylinder has this uh, basis, and the eight is to L, and so this the volume is, is this one. And you see that this goes with L squared, this goes with L, so if you make very elongated particle, this is going to be much larger than that one. And so there's a significant reduction if you have uh, this type of arrangement compared to the one that you have here. Okay, so how Onsaga took into account all this, let's say, okay, let's go from uh, article oriented in direct direction high to the distribution of, of all possible angles. And again, if, it, if this is uh, an isotropic case, uh, it's easy to see that uh, the distribution has to be 1 over 4 pi. In the case of the nematic, it doesn't know this distribution. So the trick that is used is, uh, is to postulate the distribution of all possible angles and then a posteriori calculate uh, the best of this distribution. So you don't know something, you assume that you know, you do your calculation and then you, from the result, you try to infer or you, you, you find a way to calculate what you didn't know. So Onsaga said, let's assume that I know already what is the ordering in this cinematic phase. And he just gave you, postulated this function. This is a function which you could integrate easily. It has this shape. You see that it says that the particles have a preferential orientation around pi and zero, so they are aligned. And with this function here, then it can proceed in the calculation. It can calculate the entropy of the system assuming this, this function here. And then when you do that, what you get is that you can split the free energy in two parts, so the free energy of the entropy in this case in two parts. The first part is just the translational center of mass uh, free energy, the uh, entropy that, that you know even for our sphere. This is the one that we should find in the ideal gas of our sphere. And then this is just for the ideal part component. And now there is this additional term, which is the one associated to this orientational entropy, which is associated to the probability of being oriented along a certain direction times the log of the same probability. And if you put here, of course, 1 over 4, four pi is, is isotropic, this goes to 0. So in the isotropic case, there is only the center of mass entropy. But if you put that function over here, then there is a finite contribution which comes from the orientations. Then you can, of course, uh, calculate, uh, and that's uh, the, the nice thing of so picking this, this, this function here, because in this case, you can calculate this function here. You can calculate uh, the, even the virial. 
and you get the same for isotropic case, is this expression here. I don't want to go too much in the details. I mean, the, the, in the notes, you can follow, if you like, the, the derivation. They just follow the logic. You can, you can solve the problem for the isotropic, and you can solve the problem for the, for the pneumatic case. And so you have all the approaches, all the amount of piece of entropy that you need, center of mass, orientational, and virial contribution. So let's look how these things look, be, uh, behave as a function of, of volume. Let's start with the isotropic case. If we go, if we look at the orientational entropy, we saw that uh, in the isotropic case, the distribution is 1 over 4 pi, so there is no orientational entropy. You see there is no, depending on the volume, there is no contribution to the entropy. Instead, if you look at the, the virial entropy, the virial entropy goes down a lot when you compress, when you increase the density, packing, so you move in this direction, you reduce, reduce the volume per particle, and there's a significant reduction in the number of microstates that you sample because you want to be dense, but you want to be isotropic. And so, of course, this brings in a lot of this T-type, T-shaped configuration. That brings, you, brings you down the entropy. If, instead, if you look at now at the pneumatic case, the pneumatic solution, the one where you postulate that type of distribution there, then you get an orientational entropy which, uh, of course, goes, goes down. You order the particle by aligning them. So those are just assuming that the particle are aligned. And then uh, you have a virial contribution on the other hand that is essentially very small because the particles don't exclude volume. So you don't know this function f of alpha, but you have found an expression for the free energy as a function of alpha, but you know that the entropy has to be maximized so you can minimize this expression and find the best alpha, which is the only thing that was missing in this expression here. So within this class of functions, so you can find the best alpha value, which is the one that maximizes the entropy. So in this way, Onsaga solved the problem without knowing the orientation. And again, same story like in the R spheres, you have two solutions, the isotropic solution, the back, the pneumatic solution, the, the one we have this uh, alpha value different from zero. And you see that you have again had high densi uh, low density isotropic solution is winning as a larger entropy. Again, a small volume, the ordering solution, the pneumatic solution is the one that, uh, that is controlling the, as a larger entropy. And so you can go from, you are going to, the, the prediction on Saga is that uh, if you work at high density, the system will order itself. Again, this idea that uh, entropy is uh, a driving force for ordering was there in 1950 already, thanks to this, this work of Onsag. Again, there is a large region here where you have coexistence between two phases. Again, this is the common tangent curve. It makes uh, the concavity of the free energy correct from a thermodynamic point of view. And you see the coexistence. You can calculate the coexistence states. So this problem, in some sense, has been solved. Now, this was in 1950. Then in... This, this topic has not been abandoned. There has been a huge development about the role of entropy in controlling the ordering processes. And from, uh, from this uh, simple pneumatic case, people have discussed uh, much more complicated mesophases. People call them mesophases, this type of mixed disorder and ordered phases. The center of mass is disordered, but the orientation are ordered. And, and then people have been working on smetic phases, chiral phases, where the, the order parameter uh, rotate some pitch, discotic phases, axial pneumatics when you order uh, this type of particles here. And now more recent, people started to look into banana-shaped particles, and it is found very interesting additional phases, twist band pneumatic at the most. And there are publications that discuss all this uh, new physics uh, on, I won't go into it, but that's just to tell you the power of entropy as an ordering force. Okay, now just uh, we break for uh, two minutes. Uh, we discuss just for the point of view that are curious to know how can, from a model, calculate uh, the entropy in this case, in general, the free energy. Let me just quickly review how we do this type of, of calculation on the computer. First of all, let's say that we want to calculate the free energy of an isotropic uh, disordered system, the one that uh, you can connect easily with a the thermodynamic path to an ideal gas. And then you use just standard thermodynamic relation. This is the expression of the free energy. You differentiate this. So you use the first law of thermodynamics. And then you say that, that the change in free energy is related to the change in the volume and change in temperature. You work at constant uh, temperature. So this goes away. 
And then you have what I was telling you, that the free energy, the pressure is the derivative of the free energy, the derivative of the free energy respect to the body. Now you can integrate along a constant pressure, along a constant temperature path, you integrate the free energy, and what you get, if you write the pressure as an ideal gas pressure plus an uh, uh, excess pressure, you split them, the one of the ideal gas gives you the ideal gas free energy, that's something that you know, and that's always the trick to calculate uh, free energy. So go to connect your state to some state that, that you know, for which the, the, the free energy is known, in this case the ideal gas. And then you have left to calculate this integral here, so you have to do a little bit of simulation with different volume and measure or calculate the excess pressure. Those are the dots that you see here, divided by rho square. Of course, this you can rewrite in terms of density P over rho square. And this is nice because you can double check that at low density you have approach correct uh, low density expansions, the virial expansions that usually you can calculate analytically, so it's a nice check when you do the simulation that you have to go there. And so now if you integrate this black curve over here, then you are able to calculate these terms here, and then you have the free energy. And if you do this for the for hard spheres, like in this plot, then you get exactly the free energy that I was showing you before, the entropy in that case that I was showing you before. It's a little bit more complicated if you want to calculate the free energy of uh, an ordered system, because then you have to find a, a, con a thermodynamic path connecting something that you know to what you want to know. So let's make it in a very <coughs> formal and general way. Let's say that uh, what we know as an Hamiltonian HOV, and we want to get the, the free energy of a, of, a C, of a model, which has Hamiltonian H model. So we use the trick of integrating in, potential, uh, in, in the potential. So we write an Hamiltonian, which is a linear combination of the one that we know and the one that we don't know. Uh, so this uh, H of lambda, is in, when lambda is zero, coincide with what you know, and when lambda is one, it coincides with what you want to know. And then you do exactly the same, the same story, so we do thermodynamic integration in lambda. Before we were doing thermodynamic integration in density, now we do it in lambda, and we can recalculate the free energy that we want. Let's see how it works. So the free energy is the log of the partition function, you take the derivative, the log gives you one over the partition function times the derivative of, of the partition function, but lambda is only in the Boltzmann factor, so it comes out the Hamiltonian of the model minus the Hamiltonian, if you take the derivative of this respect to lambda, the H model minus H E is here, and now if you look at this, this is just the average value of this quantity here. So now what you have to do, you have to run many simulations at different uh, uh, and during the simulation calculate H model minus H E, so the energy potential energy in the model you want minus the potential energy in the model you know, for different lambda, and then you have to do this thermodynamic integration as a function of lambda. And then you, are, you, you have solved because you go to the free energy of the model that you want, and you relate it to the model that, uh, that you don't want, that, that you want to know. Now the trick that people use most of the time is to go to a crystal that we know, and the, the, the best crystal that for which we know the free energy, is the so-called Einstein crystal, in which each particle is attached to a spring to one lattice side. So first you want to know the structure of the system where you're going to, let's say FCC, so you put uh, springs in the FCC lattice points, you attach a particle to each of these springs, and those particles are Gauss particles, they don't interact, they interact only to the spring. So that's the Einstein model and you can solve it analytically, and so you know what is the free energy. And now you slowly turn on the, free, the, the potential that you, the, of your model, and at the same time you switch off the interaction with the spring. So at the very end, the spring has gone, but the system has never changed the structure of the lattice. It remains in the FCC structure all the time, so there are no phase transition in this process, and you can calculate numerically this, this free energy here. In the case of a hard particle, this gives you essentially the entropy. Okay, so this, at least we know how to, how to do that. Okay, so we have seen uh, the ordering process in our spheres, we have seen the ordering process uh, associated to the rotations, and now let's look at a different, uh, a more uh, soft matter-like uh, a case in which entropy becomes again another interesting strong force for ordering. And this is, the, the, this is something that is more recent, 
and comes from the fact uh, from the, the availability in the in the laboratories of now nowadays of particles so called patchy colloidal particles in which the interactions between the particles is uh, directional no, so you you can think of these particles as uh, uh, hard spheres decorated by some attractive spots with a limited number of attractive spots and now those particles let's let's take a simplest case just one particle with two spots and then you immediately realize that if you're an hard sphere with two attractive spots, then uh, this particle is going to polymerize and form very long uh, uh, chains at low temperature. Now, the, the novelty of those particles is that in principle, if you go to very low temperature, you reach the ground state. And this is something that uh, you don't, uh, doesn't happen with the spherical interacting particle. And that's the physics of glasses indeed. If you take a Leonard John system, you cannot say what the ground disorder at the ground state is. That's something that you cannot even calculate. It would be nice to know it. We, we see the potential energy landscape idea that we alluded yesterday, that the energy of this inherent structure keep going down when we go lower and lower in temperature. We never reach the ground state. And the problem is that the, the ground state is, uh, we don't even know what the ground state is. Instead, in this type of particles, we know what the ground state because the energy somehow is quantized, it's proportional to the number of bonds. So if you can uh, realize a structure in which all bonds are satisfied, then this system has reached its ground state. And now, if the system has reached the ground state, now we go back to, to the R-sphere case, where the only remaining driving force is the entropy. Then the different way you can orient your particles uh, maintaining all, all possible bonds in a fully bonded configuration. So there is now a, a, another driving force which comes from entropy, even if energy is in the system, if you work at low temperature in this patchy colloidal particle. Let me show some experimental work on the, in this direction. Those are the beautiful particles developed in, in, the, in, in the group of, of Stigranic. Essentially, they deposit those particles on, on an interface, and then they decorate the two sides of the particle in different ways. In this specific realization, they can make uh, 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 hydrophobic caps on the particle, the black one, and in the middle there is an R sphere like, uh, in reality, it's a slightly repulsive due to electrostatic part. So those particles have some patches, and the width of these patches control the, the number of, of, of bonded neighbor. Let's, uh, let's assume that the patches are very small, then you go to this case of uh, a polymer that I was telling you before. So each, there is a condition that, that I like to call single bond per patch. There is just one, bond, one patch, one bond. But if you can even make it uh, a little bit larger in such a way that each patch can have two bonds, and that's the case that, that you see here, or you can make it even much larger and then you go to almost to an isotropic case. So let's stick in this, in this case here where each patch can form uh, two bonds at most. Then the ground state is provided by this, uh, in principle, by this, uh, uh, this Kagome lattice, this, this uh, lattice made of these uh, triangles which are arranged in space in this nice way. And, and in this configuration here, in the, the, essentially the only driving force for changes, if any, is entropy, because all bonds are satisfied. You cannot create a lower energetic state than this one. Other particles which uh, has been done, which also satisfy this, uh, can reach this fully bonded state, are these uh, DNA particles. We we'll talked a little bit about this in the last lecture. Those are particles essentially made by just a sequences of DNA. There is a sticky sequence uh, at the very end of each arm. So this particle form this uh, double helix part, so it's a nanostar, or patchy particle with the valence four or valence three, whatever you like. This is valence four. And then there is some sticky part here that allow you the to bind to other particles. And again, when all this uh, DNA are saturated, are bonded, then uh, there is nothing else you can do. And so the system has reached this ground state again. You can even make these uh, colloidal molecules, and this is work uh, in the group of uh, Pine and Sakan. You start in by a cluster of particles, and there are ways of doing this, this cluster, and then decorating them, covering them with, with some uh, other polymer in such a way that you isolate some patches which come from the original geometry, and then you can attach on the patches, now that they have a different chemistry, you can attach again some DNA on top of it, with some streptobidin biotin type of bond, and then uh, you have these particles which are sticky 
only on these four patches. So it's really in a realization of hard spheres with a certain number of, of patches. So we have those particles, and we can discuss more about those particles, but let's go back to the problem that I want to discuss. If you put those particles, in this case, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cartoon in two dimensions, but this is the same in three dimensions. Those particles with four patches, they can reach the ground state, right, in principle. The, the disorder ground state, and you see the disorder in this picture. There are loops of three, loops of four, loops of four. They are different from the equivalent crystalline structure that would be the diamond structure, where you have all loops of six. In the, the closest loop of bonds are six. Here you have a disorder system, and this, the disorder shows up graphically in the number of loops that you can, that you can form. In this case, we are, KBT is much lower because you, you want to reach this fully bonded state. So in principle, you're right, at the finite temper, there will be a certain small fraction of those bonds that can thermal, thermally bro break. But uh, if you go to low temperature, let's say one-tenth of, uh, of the strength of interaction, then this number is really negligible, 10 to the minus 20, something like that. Okay, so this is... Uh, the ground state uh, disorder, one, one possible disorder a ground state, right? And now you have to think exactly like we did for the hard sphere, for the crystallization of the hard sphere, same story, identical. Is this uh, disorder, configuration of disorder, number of different topologically fully bonded configuration that I can think of, sufficiently large to stabilize this crystal respect to the, the crystal ones or not? Now, let's, let's, uh, let, let's go, again. exactly, let, let's discuss this a little bit more. So, again, it's like in the R spheres. We have a competition between the number of microstates that you access at this, this, uh, this rattling of the particle in the cage, the vibrational entropy. So, is this vibrational entropy that you see here? It compete with the number of different bonding topology. This competition between these two entropic forces is going to is such that the entropy in the fluid is larger or smaller than the entropy in the crystal. And now, if you make the, the bond very directional, we know the answer already. There have been an experiment and simulation, and we know that this is the case, that the entropy is like in our spheres. If you make the bonds very directional, the system is always going to crystallize. So the strain that you put to this directionality to the fluid configuration restrict the number of loops that you can form, and so the fluid has a lower entropy than the crystal, and the, crystal, the system crystallizes. And this is not a big surprise, right? Think of water. Water is a system with four patches, two hydrogen bond acceptors, two hydrogen bond donors. Of course, there are complications, there are uh, electrostatic interactions, there are a lot of other interactions, but if you think that the hydrogen bond interaction is the strong dominating force, then that's nothing more than a patchy particle like the one we're discussing, and water does crystallize. So in that case, we know already that uh, the fluid is uh, less ordered than, than the crystal. But now there are two possibilities, which uh, again, in our sphere, this would be the end of the story. But here we have an additional parameter, which comes from the fact that uh, we are the guys who are synthesizing the particles. So we are controlling the shape of the interaction potential. And we have an additional parameter, which was missing in the R sphere case, which is uh, what I call the bond angle. How much, what is the size of the patch? How much the particle can liberate without breaking the bond? So it's the width of the, of the, of the bond. And now there are two possibilities, of course, that if I increase my bond angle, always remaining this uh, single bond per patch condition that I was telling you, is, uh, that both entropies will go up. Of course, I keep adding pieces of uh, orientation, rotational entropy to the system, but I could have two cases. This case is here, or that case is there. In this case, uh, I will be a fluid, uh, which is more disordered than a crystal at all densities, and in this case, there instead, I will have the standard physics. So we did recently the, the calculation for that. We, take, we took patchy particles with this uh, patch width, which is slightly directional. And this is uh, a value which is uh, typical of water, of silicon, of this type of atomic network former, in which this uh, geometry comes from the sp3 hybridization. And you get exactly the, 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 the phase diagram that you get for water, let's say. Okay, this is in, in number density, but uh, if you can 
convert this in packing fraction, this is roughly packing fraction 30%. And you might remember that that is indeed the packing fraction of the time of the diamond crystal, ice. Ice is a diamond crystal for the oxygen. So again, this is uh, what you would expect. There is a, a, a triple point here. You have a gas phase, a liquid phase, a triple point, and then there are more, more uh, dense uh, crystals, which are always fully bonded. So here we have uh, two, essentially, all particles have four bonds in a dense uh, PCC structure, so by here you have uh, all particles four bonded in a diamond, uh, in a diamond structure. So if you go down in temperature in, the, in this type of system, you have a gas, a liquid, and then you crystallize, like, like uh, we know from uh, molecular systems. But now I was telling you, I, we can play with trick. We can make this uh, patch with a little bit wider. And then we go to this uh, type of phase diagram here. And this phase, di this, uh, this, uh, this phase diagram has this peculiarity, which uh, oh, this is for point eight and this is for patch, different patch width. And the, the peculiarity is that now there is uh, a region of densities where the liquid is stable down to T equals zero. Right? So we are in this case here. At a certain point, the liquid becomes more stable than the crystal, right? And again, this is like uh, we have learned that the uh, hard sphere, that the entropy is ordered in high school. In high school, you also learn that when you go to low temperature, you always crystallize. There is just one, uh, one atom that does not crystallize at, at zero temperature. And that's helium. And it's not, a, it's not a strange that is related to flexibility, because helium has a very large wave function. So it's really very flexible atoms. And here is the same, right? Here we have created the colloidal particle that remain stable thanks to entropy, to essentially to classical T equals zero. There's, there's this funnel in the phase diagram that is missing in all the other materials that you can create with this uh, patchy particle. This is also telling you something that uh, the systems here are essentially patchy particle or, or particle connected with bonds, right? So it's networks. So those, as you like, from a uh, material point of view, you call them often gels, right? So those, those are stable thermodynamic state of matter. They are not uh, uh, make a stable respect to crystallization. If you are able to make them uh, with uh, sufficiently flexible bonds, and in polymer, you know that that's always the case. Indeed, those are thermodynamically stable phase of matter. So I like to call this attention again for the glass people here. Essentially, we have two different arrest mechanisms which are possible. At high density, you arrest in a into a glass, which is excluded volume dominated type of interaction. That's the physics of the glass transition. If you, but you have another possibility which is only possible for particles which have a small variance, small valence, like particles which can form three bonds, four bonds, five bonds. In those cases, the gas liquid phase separation, you saw it here, or here. It's just uh, on the left of the phase diagram. It doesn't go to very dense state. Those particles need only a limited number of neighbors. If you take uh, Leonard Jones, uh, Leonard Jones likes to have uh, at least 12, 13 neighbors. You can pack particles close to, the, to a sphere. 13 easily. And so it's nice that the system, when it goes to low temperature, try to have a lot of neighbors. But here, particles which have a limited valence, four neighbors only, four, there is no reason for them to, to, to reach dense states. And so the liquid has a very low density. Compared, it's empty liquid, I like to call them. There is 70% uh, of empty space in those type of systems. And water is one of them. The density of water of one gram centimeter cube means that 70% of the volume in water is empty. Even if you take a sphere and you substitute a sphere for a water molecule, that's the packing that you have in water. Very empty liquid. In those type of system networks, you, you have a, a different physics. You go down in temperature, you form longer and longer living networks, and those uh, because the lifetime of the bonds gets longer and longer, and they can be even thermodynamically stable. So they're never they are going to never crystallize here. So it's in some sense, Scoutsman temperature is zero for this type of system here. And those are essentially Arrhenius-like glass formers. So strong glass former, fragile on this side, Arrhenius glass former on this side over here. This idea is that, uh, that you, 
you can use the flexibility and the, that is provided you by the patch width to, to, to stabilize thermodynamically different structures, been also in, uh, uh, worked out also by other groups in following years. And there are a lot of uh, interesting applications which just came out from this idea that you increase the entropy thanks to the increase in the flexibility of the bond. Okay, so let me go to another, another point which comes out also in the same idea, class of idea, that you go to fully bonded states and now entropy is the leading force. You can play the trick of also in controlling the structure of the lattice that is thermodynamically stable. So for example, let's take these two lattices here, the diamond and the PCC, in which you can even also form all possible bonds. And then uh, you think about it, they say, okay, well, which of the two is going to be the most stable structure? The, which is the one that is going to nucleate uh, ambient pressure, let's say, this, this form here, that form there. Again, energy is the same. The number of the energy per particle is the same. So now we have to de decide which of the two has a larger entropy. And again, if you remember that the derivative of the entropy is the pressure, and you want to work at constant pressure, then you have to locate the points entropy versus density, which are maxima. So those points is a constant a zero pressure case. This is a zero pressure case. Now you compare the two zero pressure case, and you see that the DC has a higher pressure, higher entropy than the PCC crystal. So you, at ambient pressure, you stabilize the diamond structure. Where does it come from? Interesting, doesn't really, does not come from the orientational entropy. Here in this graph, I show you the entropy separated in orientation and translational. So this is the amount of entropy that you can sample rotating, and this is the amount of entropy that you can sample translating the center of mass. So this is the one that you would have in the R-sphere case only. Now, this stabilization does not come from the orientation. It comes because the entropy of the orientation is the same in these two crystals comes again from the reduction in the center of mass translation. If you compare the DC and the PCC are the same, uh, this is the range of interaction. We play for the many range, that's a math, that just focus on one, short range interaction. The DC is more uh, disordered than the PCC. The particle in the open structure can translate more, and so there is an additional entropy which stabilizes this, this crystal here. Let's go back to this uh, uh, granic type of particles which form this, uh, this beautiful Lacagome lattice that you see here. Here, in principle, you can ask yourself, okay, again, is this more, stab more stable than that one? Is this the one that I'm going to find? And then you realize that you can, in principle, you can also form other crystals uh, which satisfy this uh, the fully bond configuration. This one here, this one in the unit cell I, I show here. This is the, the Kagome, this is a distorted one, this is another possible representation in which all bonds are formed. So again, there is a crystal selection that is in, in, in this type of structures which arises essentially from entropy. You have to calculate the entropy of all those structures and find out the one that has the largest, the largest value. Here, in this case here, you can, uh, since rotations are different uh, in the different uh, polymorphs, then you have really got to calculate the rotational entropy. It was not like in the previous case, it was uh, the same. And again, you can think of, of, of this uh, uh, orientational entropy coming from the amount of the angle in 2D that you can sample. For, for example, let's make the patch exactly 60 degrees, then you see immediately that in the ground state, there is no orientational entropy, right? The particle cannot vibrate. If they vibrate a little bit, they break the bond. But if you make the patch a little bit larger, like in this case here, larger than 60 degrees, then the central particle, you can easily see that can rotate and still retain all bonds. If you have a disordered, a non-symmetric local structure, like you have here in this, in this crystal here, for example, then you see that you reduce compared to the most ordered case because now this particle can rotate less than here. So you have an amount of orientational entropy which is different in the different, uh, in the different configuration, and the result is that this is the one that has stabilized the, the entropy. And that's uh, what was uh, discussed in this, uh, in this article here. And this story, I could go on and on and provide you a lot of uh, other examples. Just me, I search for something very recent. For example, this is the work, uh, there are many. This is the work of Escopedo, which I tried to address the question, how can I design the interaction between hard particles in such a way that they mix? 
the, in, in the crystal phase. And this, this was a scientific question. So he took uh, spheres and octahedra. And if you do that sphere and octahedra, and you do for the same ratio between sphere and octahedra, that's the phase diagram that you can calculate. And, and you see that uh, there are no mixed states, right? You have or coexistence uh, in, in this region here at high pressure. You always have coexistence of a very a phase which is pure in sphere with a phase which is pure, essentially pure in octahedra. In the middle, there are always there is always coexistence. But now you can play with uh, with this with entropy. You can change the relative size of the different particles, and then you can reach to a size in which you have in the middle another phase, which is state is state thermodynamically stable, in which the particle mix a lot, and that's uh, the, this this phase that you, that you see down here for a specific ratio of the uh, sizes of the particles. Again, so those are all applications in which entropy essentially is controlling everything. And let me conclude this section by showing this, uh, this work that uh, has been very influential by in the group of Sharon Glotz, where she looked at all possible, and there are similar work in the group of Utrecht, more or less at the same, at the same time. They looked at all possible different uh, solid, platonic, Archimedean, all possible different things, and trying to answer the question, if I compress them, what is the state that entropy stabilizes? And then they realize that uh, there are groups of um, shapes which you stabilize plastic a crystal, and then it's, it become very spherical, become more of plastic crystal, or, or you have standard crystal, disordered structures for self specific uh, ratio of shapes, and uh, liquid crystal on the top. And you can rationalize according to the, some properties of these uh, shapes, which class uh, you are going to end up uh, according to the shape of the particle you work with. Okay, so that's uh, essentially what I wanted to do in these things. Let me go now to the second uh, point, which is uh, entropy attracts. So I'll try to convince you that uh, you can use entropy to develop forces which uh, can be used to, to drive the self-assembly of, uh, of particles. And I start again from the standard, uh, standard case, which is uh, two hard spheres in a sea of small hard spheres. And the question that uh, I like to pose is, this is similar to the one we discussed for the hard sphere crystallization. Look at these two graphs. In this graph, here, the two, the two big particles are close. In that graph there, the two big particles are far from each other. Which one of these two is more disordered? Which one is the thermodynamic preferential state? The one in which the particles are close by, or the one in which the particles are far from each other? Or there is really no equal probability for those. Now again, there's only entropy here because we have a small hard spheres with a certain size and large hard spheres which are my big colloidal particles. And um, I'm sure, I mean, I, I, do, I teach this in the class and uh, the answer is always, I mean, 50-50, which means that really, we really don't know. Uh, and it's not, uh, I, would, uh, I would have answered the same, right? I mean, if you, the first time you think about it, you say, why should this should be the case? Why the correct answer is this one? Why the two hard spheres should go close to each other due to the presence of other particles? And the answer is, in the end, is very simple. After you understand, everything becomes simple always. And the answer is this one. I draw here, this is taken from some David Pine lectures, but I, I draw the, the hard sphere as a polymer, which is the real experimental realization for this type of system. Now, if you, if you think about it, the, the center of mass of uh, each of these particles cannot go get closer than a certain distance from the R sphere, or even from the boundary of your container. So there is some excluded volume amount, which uh, is, is in light yellow that you see there, in which the center of mass of the particles cannot go. So there is some kind of... Uh, depletion zone around the hard sphere, which is given by the sum of the two, the average value of the two diameters, right? This particle cannot get closer by this, di this radius plus its own radius. That's the closest distance that the particle can reach. So now if I take just one of this, uh, of this uh, solvent particle and I say, okay, what is this entropy? And then I have to say, okay, the entropy of this uh, center, of, this is just a translational entropy, so it's uh, proportional to log V is the, the number of microstates where the solvent particle can go. And what is the number of microstates where the particle can go is this, uh, is this blue, light blue area, right? 
They said each particle can go everywhere in this blue area. And so I have uh, this type of, uh, I multiply this by the number of uh, polymers that I have in the system, and that's the entropy that the small particle have in this configuration. Of course, I can repeat the same calculation when the two particles are close by, and now, then I realize that uh, this time I should count only once this, this area over here, because in, in this part of the volume here, is the, is the overlap of the, two, of the two spheres. So the result of this is that uh, in this configuration, each particle has exactly the same volume as before, but has an additional small amount of volume, which is the overlap between these two, these two particles. Because now this has to count just once, not twice, like I was doing here. And so it's, it's, it's a very, I mean, so, okay, if you start to think about it, it's, oh, such a tiny amount, I mean, two are colloid in a very big container. Why should I care about this? And you should care because uh, this can be uh, 10 to the 20. This is my beast, 10 to the minus 20, but this is also large. So you, you compensate these tiny things with the large things, and you get something which becomes several times KT. And this means that this is going to drive the attraction. Okay, let's, let's do it uh, formally, so we also learn this concept of uh, effective interactions. So let's assume that we have uh, n large R spheres and m small R spheres. And we want to write uh, the partition function for this system, so that's, uh, this is written over here. There. And now you want to split the, the partition function in the one that comes from the solvent and the one that comes from the colloidal particles. So you group together all the green terms that belong to the small particle, and you get something that uh, you might formally define as a, the Boltzmann factor of an effective potential. In this way, if you do that, this is just formal. You do that, you get the partition function of your system, now is written in this way. And now you can reread this by saying that uh, if you hide the fact that uh, the, small, the solvent is inside, buried inside this system here, now you have that the big particle interact within the, the direct interaction between the big particle, one one, but then there is an additional effective interaction induced by the solvent, which depends on the solvent configuration. And that's, of course, this will depend on the density, it will depend on the temperature, and so on, and so on. It's hidden in there. So this is what we call effective interaction potential. So the one that the two R sphere really feel is that direct interaction, R sphere, for example, plus this effective interaction which comes from the solvent. Okay, the, the two guys which uh, really <laughs> solve this problem first, in, again, this is the, the beauty is that it's a very extremely simple way of solving things, which has been it's very seminal. This, uh, these two guys here that uh, you see in this, in this picture over there, they say, okay, let's try to solve it in the simplest way I can, we can do it. So let's assume that the solvent, uh, it's an ideal gas. So my solvent is made of a sphere, and the sphere can interpenetrate. It's really an, an ideal gas of spheres. So there is no interaction between the small, small particle. I only retain the interaction, the R sphere interaction between the small and the large. So I just say that the small cannot get closer than, than the sum of the diameter divided by two than to the big one. And so now this, uh, this uh, interaction between the, the small and the, and, and the small and the large is a pairwise additive interaction. So each particles, all particles are independent. It's an ideal gas. They don't feel each other. So I just do sum the interaction between all the particles in the system. And this inter interaction here, which is, uh, and, then, and then the effective potential is written there. But of course, uh, I can solve this problem because it's just a geometric, uh, a geometric problem. So if the particles, uh, the R spheres are far from each other, then this is this volume here, the sum of the two diameter divided by two, and that's the volume that where the particle cannot go. And the, if the particles are close by, uh, the, 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 I have to take the total volume, subtract the, the two times the yellow volume, and, but then I have to add the overlap volume. We were discussing this before, right? So I get a different value for this, uh, for this integral over there. I put uh, all these things uh, together, and I get uh, this, this, this as a result of my effective potential. I take this volume minus 2 with 0 outside. This becomes a small number. It's the overlap volume over the total volume, essentially. So this is really a small number I can expand. 
I expand, I get the total number of particles, the concentration comes here. So this is really the concentration of the particle. And then my effective potential is nothing more than one plus the density of particle times the overlap volume. Again, this is, uh, I can expand uh, this. If I expand it, I get uh, this uh, simplified expression that tells you that indeed the effective potential is the overlap volume, which is what we had uh, discussed before. Now, the other things that you might look at, uh, and it's nice to remember, this is the density of the particle. This is kT, so you can group these things together. And then you get uh, kT rho, which is exactly the pressure of the ideal gas. So another way of writing this effective potential is just the pressure of the solvent times the overlap volume. So it's really a very neat, simple expression. So it's the pressure. Uh, so you can uh, have a finite pressure by controlling the concentration of co-solute and then multiply by the overlap volume and you get the effective potential. So let's see what is the shape of this, uh, of this effective potential. Yeah, you have, uh, uh, you can do it analytically. Or you just go to, even I can do, I go to mathematical side, I plug the, the geometric relation that I want. I, I look for the function sphere sphere intersection. I solve it and I get that overlap volume is, is given by this quantity. This is the diameter of the colloid, the diameter of the asphere. You plot it just to see, take a look, and that's what, what you see here. So it's a, it's a short-range attractive potential, because uh, so it's something that you don't find in, in atoms and molecules. The, the attraction potential is very tiny. It's 10%, 20%, even less than the particle diameter. So this opens up also another physics, the physics of the interaction, short-range interactions which has some similarity with the physics of uh, atoms and molecules, but there are some also interesting new features. And the other interesting thing is that, that this potential you can engineering, right? You can control the depth. Uh, okay, this is only the overlap volume, but now you have to multiply this by the pressure. And the pressure, uh, it's up to you. You control it. You can add more or less polymers in your solution. And you can see, the, you can set the strength of this uh, interaction potential. So you can make it stronger or, or less. And the other thing, you can control the width by changing the size of the polymer that you put, uh, or the molecular weight of the polymer that you put in solution. So you can change. You have everything. You can control everything in this effective potential. You can really do what you want. Just for uh, curiosity, let me convince you that this is a, another simple way. Yes. It's this one here. So this, another way of looking at the same problem is uh, you say, okay, I, I could do the, I could be blind and say, oh, well, I have my two particles, and uh, I have a, a pressure which is applied on those particles. And then, of course, if the two particles are far from each other, the pressure is isotropic, and then there is no, no interactions between, there is no net force on the particles. But if the particles are close by, then, uh, of course, the, the, pr the pressure that is applied on this side here is not compensated by the pressure which is applied on that side, because there, there are no ideal gas particles which can hit the sphere on this side. So you have a net force which comes from the pressure which, from the, uh, the, the pressure which is on this, uh, on this angle over here. Because the one on this side is compensated from the one on this side, but this one is not compensated. So you do a little bit, of course, and the other things that, uh, of course, the pressure which you apply on this side is going to be along this uh, x direction only because the y component and the zeta component are symmetric and they cancel out. So you have only to look what is the, the force that is uh, arising in the x direction coming from this uh, area here. Now, this area has a certain angle. The angle depends on the distance. There is uh, some trigonometric things that you can do. And you end up by saying that the force is uh, proportional to the surface. The surface, uh, you write in that way. You take the x component, and then you get an, an additional cos theta. And now you are just to integrate from minus theta 0 to theta 0 to cover the entire surface here. You do the integration. It's a simple math. And you end up exactly with, the, with this expression here with the force. Now, this expression here with the force, you can integrate and you get the effective potential. In this expression, I didn't do the calculation, it's exactly the same that I was presenting you before. So it gives you a, another way of calculating the overlap volume in some sense. So another way of thinking of this is just that there is some osmotic pressure applied on the particle that push and keep the particle close by. It's so an equivalent way of thermodynamic of kinetics similar. Now let's uh, now look at the real ones. So those, all these are theoretical calculations, but now let's compare with uh, what happens if I put really 
and real hard sphere system into in, in a real hard uh, sphere colloids in, a, in the presence of larger hard sphere colloids, small and large. And uh, of course, the, there is uh, some hint of the structuring of the hard sphere small particle fluid. So uh, look, uh, I increase, you increase the density of the small particles in this graph, and you see more and more that this ideal effective potential, which are overlap volume, is modified by the presence of these oscillations that you see here. And those oscillations arises from the, from the structure of the hard sphere liquids. But overall, the attraction is there, it's short range, more or less, and the, so the, the, the strength of this attraction is not very different from the one that you would have predicted by this pressure times the student volume, uh, overlap volume relation. Let me just uh, uh, convince you that this is really a strong force. This is one of the first articles which showed it very nicely under the microscope. Here you have a, a, a sample, a 3D sample, but you look only on the bottom layer. And uh, I, I told you that there is a lot of, uh, uh, of this depletion interaction with the surface also, because that was also a, surf, uh, uh, a way of excluding volume, overlap with the surface. And now you increase, uh, when I'm going from left to right, you increase the, the volume fraction of small particles that you cannot see, so you only see the large colloids. And if you look at the small concentration, you see on the surface of your sample, just a tiny amount of colloidal particle which uh, stick to the surface and then evaporate again. If you increase more the concentration of co-solute or the small particles, they increase uh, the concentration of large particles which stick on the surface. And if you keep adding even more of these uh, small particles, now you, these particles start to aggregate. It becomes so intense that not only you overcompensate with the attraction for the surface, but you also start to feel the attraction between the particles, and you get a nice crystal. So you really manage to crystallize the system just by an entropy again. In a different way, it does in our spheres, but this time it's really a, a force in some sense. Another very uh, nice application that you have of these uh, depletion interactions is the one that when we control the formation of uh, depletion colloidal gels. Again, here is a plot where you have a different uh, polymer concentration and different concentration of a large particle, colloidal particle. You see, you keep adding polymer, 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 nothing happens, and then at a certain point, you really cross a pinodal, a boundary, or a spinodal, I should say, a boundary of this gas liquid phase separation induced by this entropic depletion effect. And then the system phase separate. So just a little bit before, uh, it's a collection of cluster, moving uh, isolated cluster, breaks and reform. And then you go a little bit below, you cross the spinodal boundary, the system phase separate. The structure of the system resembles the uh, spinodal decomposition pattern that probably you know, you're aware of. And then uh, the density of this uh, hard sphere becomes so large that uh, you hit the glass boundaries. There are, of course, this is an out of equilibrium system. There is uh, residual kinetics, there is aging. It's, it's, uh, it's not uh, as clean as uh, the equilibrium gel that we were discussing before, but it's a, a, the origin of this type of, uh, of uh, colloidal gel, which are very uh, common in, in, in the lab. It's nothing more than these depletion, depletion interactions. You can do a lot, a lot more with these uh, depletion interactions. You can play with the shape. Of course, the shape uh, controls the overlap volume. By controlling the overlap volume, you control the strength of interaction. So let's say that you mix together spheres in the platelet to disk, and you add some uh, small polymer to, as a depletant. Then uh, it's, what is going to happen, you might, you might think a little bit about it, it's going to happen that uh, the disk will feel this, this, this uh, depletion force earlier for as much smaller concentration of polymer, so they will start to separate out, and then if you keep adding, you will separate also, also the sphere. Right? This is the intuition that we have uh, developed according to this idea of the excluded volume. And indeed, this is, this is what's happening here in this experiment by Mason. In here, you graphically see that the volume, the excluded volume between spheres is very small compared to the excluded volume of the disk, especially if the disk has this geometry, right? It's they are parallel. This is all this amount here is excluded. And it's, uh, it's much larger than the amount uh, of excluded volume of the disk when they face in this, uh, in this type of geometry. So you expect 
that when the disks will, set, will separate out from the solution, then there will be a columnar phase of disks, and that's indeed what uh, people have seen in the experiments. Disk uh, floating on the top, because this is due to the density of the disk, which is lower, but that's uh, in, in a columnar phase. And then the R sphere, which will be separated by that point. <coughs> you can do it also with other, with other shapes. This is a case of rod-like particle and cube-like particles. Again, you can play with the density of those particles. No polymer, they are mixed together. You add the polymer, you get uh, on the top uh, the rod-like particles, and on the bottom you get uh, all the cubes together. So it's, you, you can really play with the shape and you, just, you can design the interaction the way you like it. You can even, in principle, use this, uh, this to, to move particles, right? Think of this uh, R-sphere here and ask yourself, is this R-sphere going to stay there or will prefer to go to the corner? I'll give you just a few seconds to think about it. I mean, the arrow is there, so <laughs> it should be not difficult to, to think what is going to happen. Yes, if it is the, the sphere goes on the right, there will be more free volume for the small particles because you, you take some of this and some of that together, right? So, what is going to happen is that this sphere will move on the right, and this has also been, uh, been seen in this uh, experiment, just appeared some time ago. Other possible application of this, uh, more recent application of this uh, depletion interaction, those are lock and key particles, which I'll show you in the next slides, uh, the real system. The, the lock enters in the key. How can you convince the, lock, the key to enter in the lock? Well, you just add a little bit of depletant. And then uh, since the, the excluded volume of this side is much larger than the excluded volume on that side over there, then the particle will preferentially enters inside the key. And these things have been uh, done again in, in the group uh, of Pine. You see the particle, and this is selective, right? Because the particle is very small or the particle is very large, then this, this will not work. Only the particle with the right sides will, uh, will enter in the lock pushed by this central pinter. And this has been, uh, has been realized, and as you see in the experiment that uh, they got some dumbbells, trimers, they can even have uh, this type of uh, polymeric type, uh, living polymer type structures just by this uh, depletion interaction of lock key and type. Roughness. Roughness is also another powerful way of uh, exploiting entropy in, in soft matter because you can uh, and for example, in this case, a dumbbell of a rough particle and a smooth particle, the roughness has to be of the order of the depletant sides, of course, for this to work. But then you see <coughs> very nicely that if you have uh, the two particles which are smooth, then this is our excluded volume interaction. But now if the particles are very, uh, the surface of the particle is rough, then the, the depletant can enter in all the holes, and so there is a much less driving force or rough surfaces to come close by. And this has been uh, in this nice experiment. So what is going to happen when you put those particles uh, with a depletant, that they will try to put all the smooth parts inside to shield the small, the, the small particle from the solvent, and they put uh, the rough particle on the outside. And you get this type of uh, colloidal micelles. This is the, one of the first realization of colloidal micelles that has been, has been reported to this uh, entropic effect. You can uh, even do play, with, I'm not going to discuss too much, but just for you to think about. Uh, um, until now we have been playing uh, on, uh, on the shape, but you can, uh, uh, the polymers always be, sorry, the polymer has always been uh, a sphere, but in principle the depletant can also have its own shape. And uh, this is going to control the, the, geomet the overlap volume, and so you, would have a, you can even play with the entropic forces arising from the, the extruded volume from different shapes. And one uh, final last uh, possible application, you can even uh, have a solvent, a depletant uh, that uh, aggregates. And so even the size of the depletant can change. You can control the, the average size of the depletant, and in this way you can control the average size, the, the strength of the force between the particle. So if you take, for example, like in this, uh, uh, right now, simulation, which uh, hopefully will be transformed in an experiment, you can take particles which polymerize, which, which can form some kind of clusters, or you can even percolate in this case, and those are number respect to percolation. So you very uh, uh, mono monomer, then a larger cluster, larger and larger, and then you have almost a spanning cluster when you get there. 
So now this is a, a monomer which is depleting the two large spheres. So there is an attraction, but that, uh, the size of the polymer of the depletant is growing with, uh, on moving along this uh, sequence. And what happened to the effective potential is that you go from an effective potential which is uh, associated to the, shape, to the size of the sphere at the beginning, and the sphere start to the, the solvents start to aggregate, and the effective potential gets longer and longer ranged. And since percolation is a self similar process, also expect close to percolation, and indeed the answer is uh, an effective potential which uh, becomes exponential in the connectivity length. And that you can uh, check in the simulation there. So those are all ideas which come from this uh, depletion interaction which has been, that I've reported to you to say, really we can use entropy to generate attraction between particles, and then we can exploit this attraction later on. I think I'm a little bit uh, in advance of my time, but uh, I think it's a good place uh, to, to stop for, uh, for today. Yes, I never thought about it, but uh, in principle, it's a shape. It's hard, yeah. No, there are a lot of uh, application of uh, people is using viruses uh, as uh, colloidal particles. They are even decorating the viruses, the surfaces of the viruses with uh, other molecules to control the interaction between the viruses. You can even uh, uh, polymerize the viruses, if you like, by adding specific molecules on the two extreme, or to, on the proteins which are on the, on the edge of the virus. So it's really, you can, you can do a lot. I mean, of course, people have been using them, uh, probably you're aware, for, for studying all these strange nematic phases. How nematization depends on the, on the persistence length of, of the rods, because viruses have a finite persistent length. Uh, yes, in principle, it's possible, I think, to, uh, to compare the, the phase diagram of uh, hard roads or hard ellipsoids with the phase diagram of viruses. Those shapes, because there are some that look like, well, I, I've seen, you know, that look like little boxes or like all sorts of things. Yeah. I agree with you. This effective potential that we constructed, yes. is it pairwise additive? It's not necessarily true, right? Yes. <laughs> so, not only for the last case in general, I mean, for the depletion interaction. The, the, the effective potentials, uh, uh, you calculate usually for just two colloidal particles, and, but uh, then you, you would like to use it to understand uh, the self-assembly of a system which you have a finite uh, amount of colloidal particles. And then you have to ask yourself uh, the, the question that is, uh, I says, is this a really a good representation of, of the collective interaction between the value or the presence of a third particle uh, control the overlap volume? There's some kind of uh, uh, superposition of the overlap volume such that uh, the pairwise additive uh, interaction is not uh, the real good one. And the answer is that uh, if the range of, of the interaction is uh, smaller than 10% roughly, I remember it's probably seven, I mean, there's a critical number, but it's in this ballpark, then uh, you, it, the pairwise additive interaction is, uh, is correct. You can uh, um, calculate this value, I think it's 10% indeed, by taking three, uh, three, three uh, spheres and look at the volume of the sphere that you can see fit in the middle. That's the maximum amount that you can put uh, and keep retaining the excluded volume interaction. Pairwise additive. So short range, it's okay. Will be the depletion scenario when you have uh, three different kinds of particles of very different sizes? Yes. This is uh, indeed one of, uh, in principle, you can uh, think of a depletion only if uh, the, the depletant is small compared to the, the colloidal particle. So it, it breaks down a little bit uh, in, in the case of this uh, gelling system that I show you at the end, because they are, in principle, of percolation, the, 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 the clusters uh, are uh, infinite size. So they become even large. But the, so you are absolutely right. That you should make sure always that the depletant is small compared to the, because you enter in this problem of the tripod interaction, if not. Still, uh, at least at the level of two particles, and there are a lot of applications in which you just uh, want to control the position of a particle in a box or in a specific environment. Then this type of calculation are correct. Can you wait for that? 
typical value for the depletion size for these forces? I mean, if you just keep increasing... It's 10%. If the ratio between the, the diameter is 10%, you are on the safe side. So there's always this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, comparison between enthalpy and entropy. So uh, it always has a balance. So um, is it possible if we have a long-range interaction, something like an electrostatic, then again, is it uh, possible to actually stabilize the system using entropy? Now, because the enthalpy is going to dominate. Yes. <laughs> I will try to, to answer to this question in the, in the second or third part when I discuss this competition between entropy and enthalpy, because the driving force is free and always. So if uh, you are in condition which uh, you can uh, uh, assume that one doesn't, doesn't play any role or is constant, it is the two cases that I've shown you today, then you can attribute all the effect to the remaining part, or to energy, or to entropy. But most of the cases, they are, both of them are there, and uh, they very often are co of comparable size. Is this uh, com uh, entropy entropy competition, uh, com compensation that uh, people always observe in a lot of self, self assembly system, in molecular system, biological system? Seems to be you know, the, most of the cases uh, uh, you need both. It's a competition between both that control the system. So, uh, will it be in some cases you, you might control? Them. Okay, so will it be easier to stabilize a system using entropy if you have small interactions than a larger interaction range? Uh, yeah, usually small, short-range interactions are easy to handle, easier to handle, so to understand what is going to happen. Long range are much more complicated. In particular, if you have uh, not just simple long range, but you have a competition between different types of low range or different charges, or uh, attraction and competing with, uh, with repulsion, in, in that case, you can have a very, uh, even a, um, Arrested phase separation, mesophases, uh, cluster phases. It's complicated systems. If we consider both the translational and the rotational degrees of freedom, then is there any situation where um, I can get the total energy fixed, but one part is coming from the rotational part and another the translational part? Now, under the same energy cons consideration, which structure is more stable or more likely? Like in one case, you have the energy coming from the rotational part more, and in one case, the translational part is more. So which structure is more likely? <laughs> I'm not sure. You say, let's think of a system in which the potential energy is constant. Yes. In some sense, we are in a microcanonical mm. environment, which is when the entropy rules everything. Perfect. And then you have a, I want to compare translation and rotations. Yes. Entropies in this case. Mm. And uh, which one is, uh, is more relevant? Uh, it, the answer is it depends on the other, on the density. So if you work at a, a low density systems, uh, the translation entropy always wins, and indeed we know it. The gas the gas phase is always the, the step of phases. So even if I will show you some examples in which, uh, with competition with energy, we we can even have uh, entropy winning uh, a very low density, not extremely low. Uh, but what Sanat probably told you, I mean, this uh, critical micelle cell concentration. Okay. Uh, that's a, it's an example of a system in which uh, entropy does something very low, a very low concentration. If you go to intermediate densities, then uh, this log V term that you have from the center of mass starts to be comparable to some log omega, omega angle. And there you can have uh, that the orientation entropy start to play a role. Okay. Which is the case of Granik's particle, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> 